McCoy Stadium has been right here in Pawtucket, Rhode Island for 77 years. She's seen it all. From marriage proposals to championships, the beginning of successful careers for future Red Sox stars, as well as a rehab spot for the current roster. For five decades, McCoy Stadium has been home to the affiliate of the Boston Red Sox, 48 years as the AAA affiliate. We're gonna take you through the last 50 years in our four-part Legendary Story Series, presented by Cox. The early 1970s were tumultuous for the AAA Red Sox, as they changed leagues and ownership amid financial issues. But the likes of Carlton Fisk, Cecil Cooper, and Rick Burleson would play in Pawtucket before the Paw Sox would garner much local or regional attention. That didn't happen until Ben Mondor purchased the franchise in February of 1977, although he didn't want to at first. Why should I try to bail out a bankrupt business that had $2 million in bankruptcy debt? So they finally talked me into it, but I did not buy the bankruptcy debt, I want to make clear. Ben's first full-time hire was a young Mike Tambura. Came here in February of 77 with about 60 days till opening day, nothing done, nothing sold, uh, we had an old facility in disrepair. Didn't have time to buy uniforms in 1977, so Haywood Sullivan came down with Boston Red Sox jerseys with the word Red Sox on them, which we kept for the road grays, but we figured with the home whites, why don't we just take off the R-E-D and put P-A-W so people would identify us as the home team. And that's how Paw Sox began. But fans didn't seem to catch on to the Paw Sox until an eight-hour, two-day marathon of a baseball game. What really gave us an opportunity to, to show what Paw Sox baseball was all about was the longest game. It started on a cold April night. The light tower in left center field went out. Uh, and then a couple of minutes later, the light tower in right center field went out. And then all the lights went out. And of course, we're scrambling in the, in the main office, uh, trying to find the electrician who worked for the city who had wired these before the season started. And thank God we were able to find him and he came right over. I don't know if he got the one in right center field back on. I think we started the game with only with one light tower out. But it was foreshadowing that something was about to happen, that this was gonna be a remarkable night. Uh, the wind was blowing straight in from right, right field. At 15, 20 miles an hour, it was about 38 degrees, actual degrees, but the wind chill was at least, in my opinion, in the teens. <laughs> and and uh, we spent a lot of the time keeping warm uh, by, uh, we had a big, one of those big barrels that, uh, that uh, that oil comes in and we were actually putting our broken bats and things like that and putting them on fire and <laughs> keeping our hands warm. We tied it up in the ninth and uh, that seemed forever to get to just to the ninth inning and then we kept playing and, and the next thing you know um, here it is a 21st inning they scored and again you know everyone on the field uh, on both teams you know being competitive as we are it uh, you know we didn't want to let that go then either. I had a double in the in the 20, or 21st inning with two outs, and it tied the game. And we're, and we're all, oh, oh, we got to keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, we had, oh, we got to take the field again. Oh my goodness, here we go. And 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 come to find out that we go another 10 after that, or, or 11 rather. And it was like we're going to go 11 more after this. The game was halted a little after 4 a.m. on Easter morning, when the league president finally returned from an eventful night. What was special about the longest game is it really was played over three, three days, April 18th, April 19th, which was early in the morning, and June 23rd. And the buildup for the completion of the longest game was just unbelievable. I mean, the players wanted to play in that game like it was the seventh game of the World Series. I mean, they thought that this was their opportunity to get nationally known and maybe give them a chance to get to the big leagues. It took the Paw Sox 15 minutes to finish off the Red Wings, with Dave Koza knocking in Marty Barrett to score the winning run. I've got to hit the ball hard somewhere. Uh, 
got to get that guy in. The bases are loaded, no one out. Sure, there's two other guys behind me. If I hit into a double play, possibly just one more guy. But uh, I just felt that I had to go up there and do it, you know. I was I was the intentional walk coming. What were you thinking in the on deck circle? Well, it was a long wait. It was a long wait in the on deck circle. But once I finally got up there, I, I, I felt like I had my concentration and uh, just hung in there. With this game, you know, being the longest game in history, and plus with the Major League Baseball striking, you know, with all the all the media from you know around various states, I think you know that really excited a lot of people around here. And it, I mean, it just really pumped a lot of guys up. The three major events that made this ball club was the longest game in 81, the fidrich Rigetti matchup in 82. With the biggest crowd in years at McCoy Stadium in Pawtucket, 9,400 people in a park that holds but 5,800 seats. They were there to see Mark DeBird, Fidrich, and Dave Spaghetti Rigetti. July 1st of 82, we had perhaps the greatest pitching matchup in the history of minor league ball. We had two former Rookie of the Years facing off at McCoy Stadium on a July night. But for the first six innings, the score was secondary as Rigetti struck out 12, gave up but four hits and left leading five to three. Manager Joe Morgan and pitching coach Mike Rourke stuck with the bird, much to the delight of the fans, and it proved to be a wise move. As the bird got stronger, the Paw Sox hit better. Chico Walker, a two-run shot in the seventh to tie the score, 5-5. It was probably the most the greatest spectacle uh, that we experienced here, we had over 9,000 people in the building, but we had, this is, this is in the days when there was parking lots behind the outfield fences. When, when the game was sold out, we had people standing on their cars trying to look over the fence to watch the game. It was, it was unbelievable. But the real drama came in the night. Fidrich trying to work his way back into the majors looked better than ever. I think it's an 8-5 game. Uh, Columbus had two guys on, and I believe Tucker Ashford, who was the reigning MVP of the league, was at the plate. Uh, Morgan went out to talk to Fidrich, basically told him he had faith in him, he told him to finish, to finish the game, and he struck out Ashford. The place went absolutely bonkers. The crowd was worked into a frenzy. So was the bird. And then it was over. Strike three. The Paw Sox had beaten the Clippers of Columbus the Yankees' top farm team, and the Bird had his first complete game victory in more than a year. The, the, ma the three major events that made this ball club was the longest game in 81, the fidrich Rigetti matchup in 82, and then the Governor's Cup in 84. Facing a 2-0 deficit in the Governor's Cup championship, the team used a little liquid courage to turn the momentum. We get to the ballpark that night and the main fans have all got brooms. They had given out brooms to the first 3,000 fans who came to the park. We took the team out, out to lunch, a, la a late lunch before game three in Maine. And everybody was comfortable. We knew we had nothing to lose. Uh, we all kind of sat there and uh, reminisced a little bit about the season, talked about that, that night's game. And we all had a drink or two, maybe a drink or two that you shouldn't have had. And we went out, and Robin Fuson pitched a very good, good game, and we, and we won game three. So we had life. We're down now two games to one. At two o'clock in the afternoon, we go back to Wormwood's restaurant. We sit in the same seats. We drink the same drinks. We eat the same meals. We go, we go to the ballpark that night, and Mike Rochford pitches a tremendous game. We win 9-2. Nine, nine so now, hell, we got, we, we got something going. We go back to Wormwoods the following day. We all sit in the same seats, eat the same meal, drink the same drink. And George Messerod, he had an ERA over five. He was matched up against Jerry Reed, who I think was the International League Pitcher of the Year in 1984. Messerod took the shutout into the eighth uh, got, got the first out in the eighth. Jim Dorsey came in and closed the door, and we win the Governor's Cup with a fourth place team in 1984, and we had the third, the third major event uh, in the history of this franchise. And that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, 
wrap wrap the ribbon around the ar 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 around the box. Yeah. Because well, that restaurant. <laughs> stops here. I mean, we, we, we graduate guys to Boston and hopefully when they drive up 95, they're going up there good. If not, and they want to come back and get some more help here, we're always here with open arms to welcome them back. 70s and 80s were about creating an identity for the ball club. The 90s were about educating the fan base as to what the Paw Sox job was. And our job was to develop players for the major leagues. Prospects on their way up uh, for an affordable price, obviously, at McCoy. Getting to know them a little bit, uh, getting to see them first. And, and the Red Sox fans are so knowledgeable. I mean, I, obviously the best in, in baseball. And uh, they wanted to know what was going on at the minor league level. They wanted to know who the most next uh, star would be. And, and we had them all. And, and in the 90s, you had Clemens, you had Mo, uh, you had Nomar, Valentin, Burke, Trot Nixon, Greenwell. They all came through Pawtucket. Right up the middle, Nixon shoots up, grab, and center. The Pawtucket Red Sox were hot in the 90s and early 2000s. For 15 years straight, they set attendance records. This was the spot for fans to come see future Red Sox stars. So it was cool for our fans to, to, to see the guys on the way up and then also get a chance to see them, unfortunately, when they were injured, but making their way back to Boston. And it, uh, uh, you know, the players were the thing back then. Uh, the game was, was, was the event. Uh, you know, it was baseball, true baseball here. And that's a credit to, uh, to Ben Mondor and Mike Tamburo. They, uh, they knew that these fans around here, baseball was, was their thing. It was their passion. And, and we put on, a, you know, just a, a good show. You sit down here for 18 bucks, five, five, four, four, free parking. And that's it, you don't have to spend another dime. And um, I wanted to use this as a slogan years ago, but Mike Danborough and Lou Schreckheimer wouldn't let us do it. They said, oh, no, no, no. You can't go to church for as cheap as you can come to McCoy. We wanted to put baseball where these people can see it. Providing family entertainment in a safe and clean environment at the lowest possible price. And so you could see the Red Sox stars of tomorrow for nickels, $5 tickets, maybe $10 for a box seat. The community just got behind the team and supported the team, and we ended up setting records year after year. We began the era of the 90s by winning the John Johnson Trophy as uh, the most successful minor league fr franchise. In 1999, the Paw Sox needed public money to keep them in Rhode Island. But through support from its ardent fan base, the Paw Sox were able to keep ticket prices low and renovate their home about 16 million dollars or they need to move somewhere else and so that's what they're trying to deal with and they don't have too much time to make that decision there have been minor improvements made to the stadium over the past couple of years like the new bleachers but to get mccoy up to triple a baseball standards of 1997 the paw sox need 16 million dollars without it they may have to move there really isn't a whole heck of a lot that i can honestly talk about because i think there's a lot of things that are unknowns at this point and so uh We'll just keep working toward a solution that just makes sense for everybody. You can't start piling money with three and four dollar tickets like we do, but that is my proudest. Twenty years later, we still have three dollar tickets, and uh, we'll always have three dollar tickets. But that doesn't build stadiums. So that's kind of a we're kind of a bind of our own fault there in that sense. But uh, have faith, Michael, work something out. <laughs> you know, McCoy was was built in 1942, and it was time to to keep the tradition, keep the history, but add some modern amenities that. Uh, that fans would uh, would enjoy and it was really cool to be a part of it because as soon as the 1998 season ended in September uh, we saw uh, basically them knock down a lot of the place uh, and then rebuild and renovate and expand and it was right before our eyes we remained here we worked in trailers out in the uh, in the parking lot at McCoy so we would see the progress every day and be a part of it it was a design build so basically as they were going along they would uh, design things and we were a, a big part of that. All the work done at McCoy during the 1999 renovation I'll let longtime owner Ben Mondor give you the tour. We've got a beautiful stadium. After all the hassle and the wassle and everything else, we've got a beautiful stadium. Yeah, you can see the construction. And all the outfield is new, the boards are new, the elevators are new, the lights are new, the field is new. We dug it out completely. You're in the ball game. Well, you are in the ball game here. I mean, right. you're, you're like a player. It's like your own dugout. Yeah, it's like a dugout. That's right. exactly it. Whoever thought you'd see old Cheesy McCoy with three Story, three three-story elevators. Well, the attendance is 10,031. Good for those 31.
I'm so uh. happy for those 31. If you wait a minute, I'll be right up to help you. Really? Yeah. He's cute. And this is a patio, we call it. But if you'll come here for a minute, See, you get your drinks, or you get your food, and look at you see the whole ball game. We all have our idiosyncrasies. I go insane when I see a fan reach out and touch a ball. I go absolutely berserk. We spent a lot of money for one thing. We built two fences, the one for the ball field, and the one for the fans, and there's six feet in between. They can never reach a ball. The renovation of McCoy allowed Paw Sox fans to see another generation of great baseball. The, the 2000s, the big thing was uh, a couple of uh, games that we'll always remember in history. Uh, in June of 2000, Tomo Oka uh, pitched the, the first perfect game in the, in the International League, nine inning perfect game since 1940s. It was only the third time, and the International League's been around since the 1880s. So to, to only have this be the third perfect game, it was a June night here at McCoy. He only needed 77 pitches. Uh, which was incredible. Uh, I think only a couple of balls were even hit to the outfield against him, and it happened so quick. This could be it. Max Steinle flip the first, the first no-hit perfect game in the history of the Pawtucket Red Sox. Fans, you know, knew that things were going well. Obviously, you can see on the scoreboard no hits for Charlotte, but uh, it, it just was so quick and so easy, if you will. That uh, it was just one of those games that you look up now in the eighth inning and wait a minute. Charlotte doesn't have a base runner, and the fans really, you know, got into it from that point. And uh, and Oka was a, a Japanese legend, and the Japanese media were here for every one of his starts, and they were they were thrilled to see this. And uh, he was such a good guy, easygoing guy, and uh, it was a night that uh, you know uh, will live in McCoy history. And then to have something happen just about three years later with Bronson Arroyo in 2003. Uh, that one was a little bit, uh, fans were able to follow that a little bit more. Whereas Oka's came out of nowhere and came quick. Arroyo, you kind of had a sense. I'll never forget the Buffalo radio broadcaster, his name is Duke McGuire, came up to me in the press box after the third inning. Arroyo had set down the first nine in a row and he says, he's going to throw a no-hitter. He says, I'm telling you, our guys have no chance. I, the way his ball's moving, they're way off. Uh, he's going to throw a no-hitter. Now it turned out to be a perfect game. Uh, but that one, the fans could kind of sense that from like the sixth inning on. It's Fan Fest Day. And typically during fan, fan Fest, we open the Fan Fest about the seventh inning of, of, of the ball game. And this Fan Fest, nobody left because Arroyo was cruising, didn't allow a hit, was pitching a perfect game through the seven. Down to the ninth. From the line down, the one two pitch. Swing a ground ball, hit on the right side. Adad got it. Good to Arroyo, a perfect game. Branson Arroyo has thrown a perfect game here at the Toy Stadium. And here come the Pawsocks, screaming out of the third base dugout. As a pile of Pawsocks on the first base side, right behind the first base bag. The bullpen comes in as well. McCoy Stadium history. Pencil in Bronson Arroyo, the 26-year-old from Brooksville, Florida. One of the greatest games ever pitched in Pawsox history happens today, August the 10th, 2003. You can't do better than that. A perfecto, and the Pawsox win it seven to nothing. Of course, it's one of the greatest games in Pawsox history pitched, but Tomo Oka did it here three years ago. How about two perfect games at McCoy Stadium within three years? Tomo Oka at now Bronson Arroyo pencils his name in to the Pawsox history book. Seven nothing, Pawsox win. We'll come back. We've chronicled the 1970s through the start of the 21st century. And now, we can finally get to the winning. The Paw Sox teams of the early 2000s helped to contribute to the 2004 uh, World Series. Is drilled and he says so. Runners go. Red Sox force game seven. A tremendous pitching performance by Schilling, Arroyo. Everybody was just so into the Red Sox in 2004, especially that series with the Yankees. You'd wake up in the morning and people would talk about it all day long till the night and then they'd have them come back, do what they did and capture that first elusive uh, World Champ Championship in 86 years, which is just a tie time. It was so much fun to be here in Pawtucket and see the guys that contributed to the Red Sox in 04 and to see what happened. Uh, it just tied it all together and it was a dream come true for a lot of people. In 2004, Ben Mondo was inducted into the Red Sox Hall of Fame and the partnership between the two organizations, just 45 minutes away up I-95, had never been stronger. What I've been able to do as the figurehead to a hell of a staff, Mike Tambor, Lou Schwerkheimer, Billy Wallace, and so forth, 
and it's really an appreciation I think I'm very happy today it means a great deal to me because it shows what a major league club and a triple-a club can do working together for one end purpose to make the big guys win the World Series and uh, I think uh, our working arrangements have become the envy of all the other clubs in baseball. Uh, ben and I were just uh, speaking and talking about how this relationship between Pawtucket and the Red Sox is as good as it gets in all of organized baseball. He's very proud of it. We are very proud of it. There's a loyalty that runs in both directions, and we couldn't be more pleased and more proud of the affiliation, and we couldn't be more proud of Ben Mondo. Uh, we would set attendance records uh, peaking in 2005, the year after the Red Sox won the World Series, 688,000 fans came to McCoy in 2005 and it was a stretch that almost every year we led the league in attendance. Uh, 2007 of course the Red Sox won another World Series and then the next year 2008 we were right back up there uh, attendance wise. The memories at McCoy were plentiful during the 2000s and locals got to see the future before they became the star. Jacoby Ellsbury. A breaking ball this one lays to right airs on the move won't get there it's into the gap. Ellsbury showing some of that speed we've heard about. Heading for third and gets there easily. Clay Buckles. Josh Leo Reddick. Back to the track at the wall, he leaps. Jose Iglesias showed off his masterful hands. Andrew now Miller displayed dominance on the bump. Strike three oh. called. And Lars Anderson, he hit the score. Uh, Scott Chaplin cheated when I was a kid. Lars Anderson crushed this off the scoreboard, breaks the scoreboard leg. Off the University that? of Rhode Island sign, wow. Yeah. Not that high, Pop -up. And the highlight in 2008, was uh, Big Coffee's rehab. Uh, he had a torn tendon in his wrist and was rehabbing uh, from that. And uh, he also had some Achilles problems. And uh, he appeared in four, uh, three games in July of 2008. And in Big Coffee fashion, dramatic fashion, he homered in each of the, the three games. He so. crutches one to right. And that wrist looks a okay. Big Coffee homers in his second at bat. A line drive that barely got off the ground before landing in the bullpen. And manager Ron Johnson is ready with a high five. Hey, baby. You can only imagine how much he wanted to do this in one of these at bats tonight. That ball just barely was high enough to get out of here. He hit it so hard. Uh, 2010 is a year we remember. The rehabbers really started coming uh, to McCoy from the Red Sox, and that's just a big thrill for the fans to see you know, Red Sox players come down up and close. And in 2010, we had uh, just in one season, we had Jacoby Ellsbury, Josh Beckett, Mike Roll, Dustin Pedroia, and Jason Baratek rehab here at McCoy. Uh, you know, household names, world champion names that came here and, and really drove the fans. So, one other topic right, from all those championship teams is that they had unknowns who weren't exactly hotshot prospects, the kind that you read about in Baseball America. I remember in 2007, a lefty reliever named Javier Lopez emerged on the scene. In 2013, you had uh, Brandon Snyder, a third baseman. And then just as recently as a couple years ago in 2018, you had Ryan Brazier come out of nowhere. It become, became a huge reliever down the stretch for that Red Sox team and continued his success into the playoff. The Paw Sox weren't just a feeder for the Red Sox. They were also very competitive in the International League, going on to win their third and fourth Governor Cup trophies in 2012 and 2014. It makes it a lot of fun, and as you can see, they, they earned it and they have a lot of fun. So. Uh, we'll just go ahead and see what happens, but they play hard and work hard every day, and that's what it's about. Arnie, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congrats to you, too. Thanks. Thank you. And Arnie just got dumped on with water from the Gatorade. They're dousing, they're dousing the skipper. Champagne, <laughs> Gatorade, but hey, what the heck. Paw Sox are in the playoffs. Back up to Aaron. All right. Hi. Hey, fans. We just wanted to say thank you for tuning in to Cox Legendary Story Series. Now we want to kick it back one more time. Blue skies, every little thing 
summer sunshine, moonlit nights. My favorite team playing under the lights. It's a family fun tradition, it's a summer fling. To catch a rising star and to stand and sing. Paw Sox Baseball, where dreams begin. Paw Sox Baseball. <laughs> Stretching days when they extend right into autumn, cause I hope they never end. I'd watch them year round if you wanna know the truth, but I'll while away the winter reading back to days of growth. High drive, deep right center field, Reddick back to the track at the wall, he leaps! And did he get it? He got it! Bell charging forward, it's a long run for Bubba, he dives, he's got it! What a catch by Bubba Bell! We are one team, we have one mission, caring for our kids while preserving our tradition. We've looked forward to the spring, the crack of the bat, the whoosh of the swing, warmth of summer, golden twilight. My favorite team never gives up the fight. It's a fun tradition, it's more than a fling, to catch a rising star and to win a ring. Here it comes. There it is. They swept. The game is over. And someday they will come true for you. Believe in dreams and you will find they come true for you. Pa Sox Baseball. To the end be like a quick thing at the end where it'll say like host Alex Richardson. And it has like all the people we've interviewed but just like a funny blooper, so something like this. Oh, you know what, I, I'll talk about um, the spreads that okay. these guys have bought. Yeah. All the work done. <laughs> no, I just had one hit me right in the eye. <clears throat> yeah. Because of that restaurant. <laughs> okay, so say that a little bit, just quick. Something like that, right? And you edit whatever you did. Edit whatever you want.